Today is the 68th anniversary of the historic arrest of Rosa Parks on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And the Congressional Black Caucus is pushing to make today, December 1st, a federal holiday, Rosa Parks Day, in honor of the civil rights activist and icon. In 1955, Miss Parks' decision to not give up her seat to a white man sparked the game-changing 13-month Montgomery bus boycott. Well, there is one civil rights icon who already has a national holiday, and this, everyone is now saying, is his book, King, A Life. If you thought you knew, well, you probably don't. Reviewing the book for the New York Times, the review stated, quote, the book supplants the 1986 King biography, Bearing the Cross, as the definitive life of King. The author, one Jonathan Ike, lives in Chicago, teaches here, has three daughters. If that's not enough, he's written what may be the testament to a man who's in the game when it comes to most important Americans, at least in the America we've aspired to become. Mr. Ike, joining us now, thank you for your time. Nice to talk to you today. Thanks for having me. Well, bravo. It's on everybody's read list. Uh, what is the biggest misconception, do you think, uh, about Dr. Martin Luther King? I mean, of course, he's a lion. He's on the Mount Rushmore of individuals who change society, a mythical figure. Uh, biggest misconception? You know, one of the problems we have when we make people into monuments and national mm -hmm. holidays is that we lose sight of the fact that they were human. You know, you mentioned the Rosa Parks incident and uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. King did not want to get involved in the right. Montgomery bus boycott. He initially said no when he was asked just to attend a meeting. And we forget that he had doubts. He had struggles. He suffered by him, literally urging him to commit suicide at one point. And King persevered through all this. But we forget that it came at a cost, that he suffered for this, and that he would not give up no matter how difficult things got. So I wanted to write a book that showed a more human portrait of King uh, to remind us that uh, he was much more than that monument. Um, he was real. Yeah. I mean, they often say, uh, in many cases, you know, beware, you know, who you lionize because your icons often become cons. Um, I mean, Mr. King obviously wasn't that, but was in many more dimensions, uh, as you said, and you, you've laid out meticulously uh, than the, the, the strictly lionized individual. So a fascinating yarn in your book uh, is on Chicago. Of course, Reverend King stared down hate in every corner of America. Uh, and when he came to Chicago in 1966, of all the places, pick your Southern Civil War hub, your infamous bridge, et cetera, um, all that. And then Reverend King said he'd never seen uh, hate and racism like he'd seen in Chicago's Southwest side, right? Uh, tell me about that. That's right. In 1966, came, King came here and, and actually moved into North Lawndale and um, really led a series of protests that were designed to attack some of the problems we still have today. Segregated schools, segregated neighborhoods, inequality in hiring, police brutality. He came here and really faced the kind of uh, hate that, that he had seldom seen, and he'd seen a lot of hate. He said, as you, as you noted, that the attacks he faced here were crueler than anything he'd seen in Birmingham or Selma or Montgomery before. And he came here because he believed that the North had a problem, too. Yeah. You've also written the books on Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, and now Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, if not the three, there are others, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, Oprah Winfrey, but you took Robinson, Ali, and King, three seminal figures truly in the African uh, diaspora and the story of black America. Were there, there commonalities, any striking connective tissue between these three men? I think there's a great commonality, a great thread. Ali, King, and Robinson, all believed that America had failed to deliver the promise mm. of justice for all, that all men are created equal. And they all believed that they had the duty to risk their own lives, risk their uh, careers, risk everything for what they believed in to try to make America more complete. So in that way, they're great patriots. Uh, I th think of King as, as one of America's founding fathers. 
Wow, that's a remarkable answer and concise, which we needed. Thank you. So when I first uh, when I first read of your book, uh, one time I read a rant by John Adams, the founding father, as you're speaking of them, and, and he, he used the word temerity. I think that's a great word. When I first read of your book, I thought, you know, who has the temerity? to even try to write the book on Dr. King, you know, so many decades later. Uh, you do, you did. Um, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that gumption, the guts? Was that born um, of the success of the book on Ali, on Robinson? Uh, where, where'd the fortitude come from? I don't know that it's fortitude so much as a sense of responsibility, a sense of mm. privilege to tell the story I just felt like King hadn't had a biography in more than 35 years when I began this project, and he needed a new one. We need a new King biography for every generation. And I wanted to write this book while there were still people around who knew King personally. So I scrambled before COVID and traveled the country interviewing people like John Lewis, Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, Harry Belafonte, the people who knew King best. So I didn't feel like it was temerity. I felt like it was just a great privilege. Yeah, not temerity, a responsibility. Um, that's a wonderful sentiment. The book is King a Life. Google it. Your Google will probably break with praise. Uh, it's a remarkable work. Uh, Mr. Eig, thank you for your work and thank you for your time today. Thank you.